we worked on a river called Arika River, which is in uh, Yuma County, Colorado, uh, near the uh, Kansas border. And uh, this was prompted by the discovery of an invasive species uh, called a uh, mosquito fish. So Great Plains uh, is a uh, vast area of land uh, spanning from Canada to Mexico. And so beavers there are often called dry land streams. So they are shallow, sandy bottom, and seasonally very dynamic. Many of them are intermittent, meaning that they do not have water in the channel uh, through, uh, uh, for, uh, for all of the year, throughout the year. So they kind of you know, dry and wet, and fish have to uh, move uh, to find refugia and move back. And uh, next slide. And here's a kind of stunning picture of the Arikari River uh, over time. And this take picture was taken at the same place uh, at around the same time of the year for three decades. But you can actually see the river shrinking in size. Uh, the river is actually losing the water. And in the 80s, it was a shallow meandering uh, stream. But then by the 2006 and now, uh, the riparian, riparian area has been encroached. And you uh, only see water in a small pocket. Uh, next slide. And the place that I, I'll take, I'll talk about why this is happening, but uh, Arikari River is in the Republican River. Some people call this, this uh, the middle, middle fork of a Republican River. And it's a, a, a truly uh, unique uh, uh, basin in Colorado because the uh, river originates from the, uh, the plains. Uh, unlike Platte or Arkansas rivers, where they originate from the snow, uh, from, from the mountains. So they are snow uh, driven or snow melt driven systems, but then Republican River Basin is kind of an isolated uh, 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 and groundwater fed uh, uh, system. And the climate is very dry too and they don't get uh, much precipitation. So uh, the river uh, is uh, relying upon the groundwater influence or groundwater recharge uh, to maintain the water in the stream channel. Uh, so the next slide. But yeah, let's go to the next slide. But the groundwater pumping has been depleting the aquifer. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, big agricultural uh, uh, pl uh, uh, part of Colorado the Yuma County in which uh, this, this study took place is uh, typically ranked among the top five corn producing counties in the USA. So they have started the uh, intensive uh, center pivot uh, irrigation systems uh, uh, since around 1960s. And the water table, uh, as a result, the water table um, has been declining. And uh, yeah, next, uh, next slide. And the, uh, here's a, uh, the map of the extent of a, a, a water table dropping or, uh, or uh, drops. And uh, where you see uh, on the map on the right, uh, where you see red, the, uh, the water table has uh, declined uh, more. So if you go to a place like a Northern Texas, the, uh, the water table has dropped about uh, 100 meters. And the Rickery, um, by now, somewhere between 15 to 20 meters of uh, drop, uh, drawdown uh, has occurred. So, uh, so let's go to the next slide. So, as I said earlier, the um, Great Plains fishes are uh, understudied, but then they are also diverse uh, uh, sources of, uh, uh, of fish in Colorado. For example, um, you know, if you think about Colorado, people always think about uh, trout in the Rocky Mountains, but then they're not quite specious. But then uh, there are about uh, 37 native species known uh, from uh, Eastern Colorado Plains uh, streams. Uh, however, about half of them, 20 out of 37, uh, have been either extirpated, endangered, uh, or threatened, or special concern. And in Arikari, uh, of the 16 native species known to occur, seven have been lost, uh, meaning, uh, and uh, five of them, um, uh, 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 the river shiner and so forth, um, have been declared extirpated. And the two other species, red shiner, sand shiner, um, have, uh, have gone undetected for about 20 decades. 
so uh, for about uh, 20 years. So they're probably gone too. But then uh, there are still a couple of uh, state listed species like brassy you know, and orange throat that are uh, still persisting uh, at the Rickery River. Um, and uh, these are the uh, species uh, that are currently and historically known uh, from uh, the um, Rickery River. Uh, the ones with the, uh, uh, the, the arrows, uh, not arrows, but the crosses, uh, have been extirpated, and uh, I think you have to kind of fast forward, Cole, because I think we're going to have uh, more. So these the the or uh, the orange uh, crosses are the ones that are uh, uh, have gone undetected for about twenty years. The red ones have been gone, and then the one circled uh, in yellow, the orange th throat that are in the middle, and the brassy you know, on the right. Are, are are the two uh, two state listed species that are still uh, occurring there? Uh, uh, next slide. But to give insult um, into the old, already uh, uh, stressed system, um, I take my class uh, to Arika River every year, and then during the 2018 field trip, we discover something we do not like to discover, which is a school of mosquito fish. And the IUCN uh, has a uh, the world 100 world's uh, worst invasive species, and most uh, western mosquito fish is one of them. And these are small uh, bodied individuals, but uh, they are very numerous and they're very aggressive too. So they can eat eggs of other species. They can also chase, nip, and attack adults of other species. And they can also uh, outnumber uh, many of the, uh, the native species. So we were concerned. Uh, let's go to the next slide. We, have, we still have the uh, native fish uh, assemblages, but then what's the status of native plains fish um, given the recent discovery of the uh, uh, mosquito fish? And how widespread are they uh, 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 in our study site? So that was the motivation uh, uh, for the study, which was funded by uh, uh, Lois Webster Fund. And then the project uh, will be uh, presented by Cole. Yes, thank you, Dr. Kano. So as Dr. Kano mentioned, our main motivation for this study was the discovery of western mosquito fish in our, the Arikari River stream. And for our study, we had four main objectives that we wanted to achieve. The first was to determine the mosquito fish distribution along the study area. So what we wanted to know from this is were the western mosquito fish distribu distributed evenly throughout the entire stream, or were there certain areas that they were excluded for some reason? The second was to describe the mesohabitat selection by mosquito fish. Now, essentially what this means is, is there a particular habitat type that they prefer or frequently use in their life history? Thirdly, we wanted to characterize the fish community that is there, as well as how it changes through space and season. And lastly, we wanted to assess the effects of stream section drying on these same fish assemblages. Now, to achieve these objectives, we, we chose the Nature Conservancy's Fox Ranch for our study site. This 14,070 acre ranch in Yuma County, Colorado was acquired by the Nature Conservancy in 1998. According to the TNC's website, it is managed currently for both conservation as well as for agricultural purposes, with cattle grazing leases being the primary activity. The Audubon Society also declares this site an important bird area, since many eastern and western species bird, range, bird species ranges overlap in this area. Some of the bird species that can be found on this property, starting from the top left and going, going clockwise, are the burrowing owl, the ferruginous hawk, the upland sandpiper, the lark bunting, as well as wild turkey. And even during our study, we found other species of animals that were more of the reptilian and amphibian type, such as snapping turtles, as well as leopard and bullfrogs. So as you can see, this region is currently still very diverse in the amount of species that it supports. For our study site, we sampled an eight kilometer stretch of the Arikari River on the ranch, and we, sam we sampled at 12 sites on this stretch. Our two sampling periods occurred in May and August 
to, to see if we could assess seasonal variation. We sampled from May 25th through the 29th and August 12th through the 15th in 2019. I would also like to note that sites seven and eight are separated by the largest development that is on the property, which is the county U road that runs north and south. Now to illustrate the extent of the seasonal variation that we've been referencing, let me show you a couple of images from our site seven. This first image was taken in May when the flows were stronger. <clears throat> this stream exhibits a relatively mo moderate stream width with relatively minimal vegetation. What this allows for is ample aquatic space for fish to carry out their life history processes. And it also serves as a small buffer against um, very large temperature fluctuations. And it also assists in maintaining oc dissolved oxygen content in the water. However, here in August, the amount of, wa of water flow is reduced significantly. This has caused the stream to narrow, allowing for vegetation to thicken both around and within the stream itself. There are even areas of the stream that were dried completely at this site. This not only reduced the amount of aquatic space that the fish community can use, but it also increases temperature fluctuations and reduces the amount of available oxygen. Now, before we go any further, I would like to define some of the main habitat types that we observed during our study. We defined run habitats as being section of a stream that is shallow, but yet has fast, uninterrupted flow. Pool habitats as being deep sections with little to no flow. Backwater habitats as shallow, low flow edges of a stream that frequently have much vegetation. And pool run habitats which are habitats that express traits of both runs and pools. It is worth noting that the backwater habitats were only observed in May when the flows were highest, and we only described pool run habitat in August when the flows varied within different sites. It, I would also like to note that in August, our survey area consisted of more pools, less runs in general. <laughs> Here is an example of a healthy run habitat. It has a moderate width and depth, as well as has a steady flow and very little vegetation. So it is what you would typically think of when you think of a stream or normal river. This is an example of a, one of the largest pool habitats that we sampled. Now, while most of the pools were fairly manageable for us to sample, this one in particular was very deep and it had very significant amounts of vegetation. So, Dr. Kano and myself, when we sampled this stream, both got water in our chest waders during this, and it was a little bit more difficult, but we managed. And this is an example of backwater habitat. Now, as you can see, it is significantly set off from the main flow of the stream, so it's typically to the side. It is very shallow and has significant amounts of vegetation. One of the reasons for this and what kind of character the reason why the backwater habitat was only observed in May is whenever uh, water flow is re restricted, whether from drought or groundwater pumping or for any reason, this habitat is typically no longer inundated with water. So it is a very temporary habitat type. For our sampling methods, in May, we sampled twice using an electrofishing method, as well as taking a third pass using a seine net and electrofishing pass whenever it was possible. Electrofishing essentially consists of us using electricity to temporarily and without harming the fish, stun the fish and allowing us to catch them in a net in order to size them and sample them. Seine netting is a method in which we use two individuals who are holding a large net who essentially drag, who essentially pull it through the stream and catch fish. And oh, I'd also like to mention that the backwater habitat we sampled using a single dip net pass. In August, we, we used a different approach. We used only two passes instead of three, and we only used electrofishing for run habitat and only seine netting for pool habitat. This is because the reduced amount of aquatic space or water that occurred in August meant that we were able to catch fish much more efficiently. Species length 
Species as well as link were recorded for each fish that we captured. And at each site, we recorded habitat, flow intermittency in August, as well as water quality variables such as pH, temperature, and conductivity. Here is, oh, sorry. One source of sampling bias that we did observe whenever we were sampling is that we found that deep and vegetated pools reduce the sampling efficiency that we had. So there is a chance that our data may, be, may not be as representative as it would be otherwise. We also noticed that the very small sizes of western mosquito fish only rarely and occasionally prevented their capture. Now, here is a picture of Dr. Kato and I seine netting in the deep pool that I showed previously. As you can see with the seine net, there are two individuals that hold each end of the seine net and we drag it through the pool in order to catch as many fish as possible. Here is a picture of our colleague, the now Dr. Kim and I dip netting backwater habitat. Since backwater habitat is typically very shallow and highly vegetated, the best way to sample them is to spot the mosquito fish by sight and then quickly scooping them with the dip net. And here is a picture of Dr. Kano with electroshocking gear right before beginning a pass. I would also like to very quickly define the flow types that we described in August. Since in August, with the reduced flow, there were many different uh, flow states, you could say, that occurred between the sites in August. We defined flowing as being habitat with significant steady stream flow, drying as habitat that consists of just small isolated pools, an intermediate as somewhere in between. Now for our results, we collected a total of 9,489 individuals over the entire study, with 2,806 collected in May and 6,683 collected in August. Now, out of, <clears throat> we found that Western mosquito fish were the most abundant species that we captured in May or the second most in May and the most abundant species in August, apologies. We also found many native species that were present during both months, especially the state listed species such as the brassy minnow and the orange throat darter as pictured to the right. The native plains killifish, however, was never located. Some of, some of the species that we did end up capturing are, are pictured here such as the green sunfish, which this fish is more of a pool-ish fish. It typically prefers more pool habitat areas rather than runs. And we also captured many other minnow species, such as the fathead minnow, as well as the creek chub, the central stone roller. And lastly, we captured a black bullhead catfish. Now these are the species that will be depicted on the charts that I will show in the future, and they will consists of the exact same color scheme. And for simplicity, the light blue represents the western mosquito fish, the dark green represents orange throat darter, and the uh, dark orange represents brassy minnow. Now from this chart, this chart shows the number of individuals captured of each species during both seasons. Now what this shows is that the western mosquito fish have ex an extensive presence along our study area. They were captured at every single site during both seasons that we sampled, with one exception being site 12 in May when the western mosquito fish were not captured. This, these pie charts uh, show species relative abundance during both seasons and habitat types. So what this shows us is that, we, is that with the western mosquito fish tend to frequent mesohabitats that would have low flow and st or stagnant bodies of water, such as pool habitats or backwater habitats. Now, the, this could indicate that the use of these habitat types may further assist western mosquito fish in their life histories. We also use a statistical technique called a principal component analysis to determine if the, the overall fish community changed from May to August. And indeed, we found it did. For our August surveys exhibited a relative increase in western mosquito fish, brassy minnow, fathead minnow as well, while other species such as the orange throat darter decreased. 
In this chart, with this chart shows fish assemblage composition in August among flow types. We, with this, we found that western mosquito fish tend to be present in areas with less flow. What these findings suggest is that the seasonal change in groundwater pumping may assist in the invasion of western mosquito fish. And while many, <coughs> oh, sorry. Now, while many native species currently persist in abundance, the plains killifish may have been displaced by the ecologically similar western mosquito fish. And while mosquito fish appear to thrive in stagnant bodies of water, they are also more abundant in August. Due to these findings, we need to conduct species interaction experiments and monitor these fish communities if we are to conserve them. I would like to, uh, for our acknowledgements, I would like to thank obviously the Audubon Society of Greater Denver, as well as Prairie Biotic Research Incorporated for funding this research, as well as some, some other worthy mentionables, such as the Nature Conservancy for providing logistical support, and as well as for all the other individuals who helped us as well. How do I exit? Thank you very much, Cole and Dr. Kano. Um, that was fascinating. I was first introduced to these kinds of very small native fish um, by a researcher not terribly different than you, who was just ecstatic about studying them. And he compared these small native fish to warblers. And when you show the picture of the orange throat darter, I fully understand why. It's such a brilliant, small little fish. Um, so we have several questions about the fish themselves. Um, can you, do you happen to know where the mosquito fish came from? how they got to be in the Arikari? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, do you want to go, Cole? Yeah, no, go ahead. Yes. OK, so we, we believe that the Western mosquito fish, there's, there have been records that they existed in areas that are downstream of the Arikari River where we sampled. And so we think they may have just swam upstream to the area that we sampled, but we can't say for certain. Wow. That's yeah, it. and we also think that they might have escaped from the uh, the farm ponds or like retention ponds um, when the uh, you know like when it rains a lot or when it rained a lot, and then just you know moved up the uh, move moved up uh, 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 the river uh, corridor, but it, it must have come from the from downstream area. Interesting. I would intuitively I would have thought they flow downstream with the water, but you're saying they, they moved upstream against the current. Right, yeah, yeah. And this is a very slow moving meandering river too. Uh -huh. So even for this species, which, does, which is not equipped with uh, strong swimming capabilities, I think there are certain times of the year where they can negotiate the flow. Interesting. And I, since this location is on the western edge of the drainage, um, can you tell us anything about the status of some of these key uh, native species uh, further east in, in uh, Nebraska and Kansas? Yeah, sure. So the, the trend um, has been uh, Nebraska, Kansas. Uh, so groundwater pumping is a region-wide issue. So rivers are disappearing uh, in many places. So, for example, Arikari, uh, you know, it's a uh, it's the size of the river that was historically similar to like Puder, and that's that's a trickle now. And what's happening is that is a pattern where uh, species that are adapted to uh, large uh, bodies of water uh, have been under selective pressure because the rivers are shrinking. So, species like you know um, um, the um, Brassimino, uh, orange throat dotter, uh, they are hanging in there because uh, they can deal with, uh, uh, they, they can adapt to uh, small streams. But then uh, species like sucker mouth minnow, plains minnows that are more adaptive to uh, larger rivers, they are also uh, not doing well in the other parts of, uh, in the, to the east as well. 
also because of drawdown of the aquifers? Yeah, that's correct. And uh, uh, mosquito fish are also popping up in the, our Arkansas South Platte, uh, 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 in many, uh, many uh, um, plains, rivers in Colorado and around. So that's, uh, that's a concern um, that CPW shares with us. And this has prompted uh, additional study uh, to uh, look at the interactions between mosquito fish and the uh, native species. So uh, with uh, coal helped too, but uh, we're building uh, experimental streams in the basement of our building uh, where we can actually manipulate things like flow uh, and the temperature and then uh, density and uh, see if uh, there are uh, interactions uh, behaviorally uh, that can explain the patterns we see in, uh, of, uh, uh, of fish distributions in the wild. Interesting. Um, do you know if mosquito fish are in the North Fork of the Republican in Yuma County? North Fork. Yeah, uh, I don't know off the top of the head. Uh, I, I, I would have to check. Okay. Um, I, in, a, in a broader sense, um, I'm wondering if if the mosquito fish problem is fairly widespread or it's uh, more localized in the area where you studied in that part of the world? No, it is a, it is a widespread uh, issue. And uh, we actually see them in Japan too now. <laughs> uh, and uh, they outcompete uh, the native species. Uh, and then it is definitely popping up in uh, 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 places along I-25, uh, including some of the uh, uh, transition uh, streams, which we call. So transition between the mountain trout streams and uh, plains, uh, tru truly plains uh, rivers. Uh, so they're popping up uh, in the uh, I-20, even west of I-25 too, because I'll just tell you one story because yeah, for the experiment we're running, uh, we're trying to source uh, mosquito fish from uh, a pond complex in Fort Collins. So they are they're in the flat plains of uh, Poudre River, uh, but uh, it's in town in Fort Collins. Uh, so they are they are they are spreading. Uh, they are uh, popping up in uh, in Denver uh, and south as well. Uh, so, so we are clearly uh, wondering. Uh, I mean, we don't need another additional threat, right? You know, we have climate change, uh, water diversions, and uh, on top of them, uh, mosquito fish. Uh, it it uh, could, can be a uh, you know final uh, blow to uh, some of the uh, uh, state listed species. Right, and as you said uh, initially, they're a very aggressive. Uh, species as well as being invasive. So um, that points to the next question, which is um, tell us did when you captured them and we could see large numbers of them, of them especially in some of your dip net photos, did you return them to the river or what did you do with the mosquito fish that you caught? Uh, it depends on if you are with a um, uh, William Burnage from TNC. He says liberate them. So he says, if we catch uh, mosquito fish and the uh, bullfrog uh, tadpoles, we actually throw them uh, away from the river. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we actually, yes, uh, killed uh, quite a few mosquito fish, but then we also realized uh, it would be challenging to have a population level effect by killing uh, even hundreds of those, because they are they are they are very abundant locally when where they occur. Like like you know, like our data shows, uh, we caught three over uh, three thousand mosquito fish individuals, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Um, and that's that's a, that's a lot. Of, that's a lot. So uh, we are um, having in discussion with CPW uh, about the ways to uh, remove them or eradicate them. But then we think that the physical removal is, is would be challenging. Uh, there's a way that's being tested on brook trout. So brook trout is also invasive and outcompetes with a native cutthroat trout. But then uh, researchers in the Idaho, in the Idaho um, started a technique that skews sex and eventually have a population nothing but males. And uh, we're wondering a similar technique could be used uh, for um, non-trout species, including mosquito fish, uh, as their control. Um, so 
it's a it's a it's it's a it's an issue um um in terms of once they once they established uh, uh robust populations it get, it's it's basically a pest it's it's tough to uh, uh eradicate them they have uh they can reproduce quickly uh multiple times a year and uh, fishes are fecund, uh, unlike the the bird. You know, one one egg per pair of uh, breeding birds, <laughs> right? <laughs> that's uh, that's the, this this species has a completely opposite uh, uh, reproductive strategy. Uh, so so it's interesting, but we also think that their invasion may be context dependent. So if we could increase the flow and have more flowing environment. We might be able to slow down uh, the the spread of the species, and we I also encountered a study in Europe where the uh, mosquito fish have a lower tolerances for salinity, and salinity is a very important issue for agricultural production because uh, saline waters actually uh, reduces agricultural crop production. So in places like South Platte, uh, you know, there's a uh, study actually done uh, on salinity, and then there's a lot of uh, conservation measures to uh, lower the salinity. But then, if that uh, results from the European study apply, uh, lowering salinity may be facilitating spread of the mosquito fish too. So, so there seems to be an interesting trade-off uh, of what you think uh, good for agriculture. Lowering salinity may actually comes with the unintended consequences. Wow, a lot of factors at play there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and we're actually trying to uh, manipulate salinity too, and uh, see see if that uh, uh, kind of flips the outcome of the competition. Interesting. Uh, a couple more questions. Um, I understood when you were describing the habitat initially that historically the uh, Rickery River used to flow a lot more. Was that flow year round or? Uh, primarily in the spring time, historically. Right, right. Do you know, Cole? I do not know the answer to that, no. <laughs> yes, so uh, so Arikari were actually historically intermittent, uh, but then the intermittency has been exacerbated by groundwater pumping. Yes. So we're having a longer uh, period of drying, a uh, longer dry period, and there are some really, really bad years that occur, uh, you know, once five right. to ten years now, where uh, the river becomes um, nothing but isolated pools for uh, like July, August through September. Right, and then of course, as you have found, that uh, uh, gives a preference to the mosquito fish because yeah. of the habitat type. Seems uh, like it. Yeah. Um, so. Are there any ways to prevent um, the loss of water to agricultural pumping? For instance, could the Endangered Species Act be a tool for that? Or are there any, any uh, handles in government that might facilitate that? Right, I yeah. So if you talk to, I mean, yeah, I've been talking to, yeah, uh, folks uh, in, in the state and uh, it may be a while for the, um, so those species like Brassim, you know, orange throat daughters may not get uh, listed under the ESA um, just because of the, uh, its distribution in places like Kansas and Nebraska. Mm -hmm. And we can find, you know, they can, you know there are some um, populations that are doing okay. Um, and uh, conservation tools uh, are wise, the, um, the purchase of a, the, the Fox Ranch by TNC was one of those um, uh, uh, conservation measures to protect the uh, riparian and aquatic ecosystems, uh, which uh, 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 have the you know, short, uh, short prairie glasses and uh, uh, mostly uh, intact uh, aquatic uh, fauna. Because uh, you know, prior to the discovery of the mosquito fish, uh, that, that reach of Arikari had nothing but native fish. Uh, which is uh, which is kind of you know rare nowadays, and then uh, TNC has also considered uh, working with the Colorado Water Conservation Board, which can acquire the uh, inflow uh, water rights. Um, and if you could actually 
um, do that, 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 that would be great. But then the issue here with the groundwater, as farmers and ranchers describe there, it's a big bathtub. It's, it's a big bathtub that anyone can kind of access to. And depending on where you are, the uh, access to the uh, to the water table may differ, but then uh, it's been described to me as a classic um, uh, uh, the uh, tra tragedy of the common yes one situation of that groundwater. Uh, somebody somebody else might. Well, thank you very much. We we really uh, enjoy funding and supporting projects that like yours. Um, have influenced or are working to influence management uh, because we not only want to know more about the non-game species in the state, but to influence the management of them to enable them to sustain their populations over the years.